Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our first live webinar of 2023. Uh, I see some familiar names on the call today, so good to have you back this year. Um, there's a couple names I do not recognize, so thank you for attending. For those who do not know who I am, uh, my name is Thomas Purcell. I'm the director of our Employee Benefits uh, Service Department here at URL. Uh, URL is a wholesale uh, independent brokerage, so we specialize in uh, individual health under 65, Medicare, group health benefits, life and annuities. So uh, I've been handling the employee benefits division, and we've been doing these webinars for three. This is the third year now. So uh, we have a great lineup for this year in 2023, a lot of cool content that we're going to be reviewing uh, uh, a lot of great uh, co-presenters that I'm going to be having join me. So I'm really excited for this year and the content we're going to be sharing. Um, if you've attended any of the webinars last year, you're familiar with my guest here today, uh, TJ from Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney. He's the shareholder and labor attorney, and he's just a wealth of knowledge uh, in terms of anything related to HR and employment law. So I've had him as a guest on in the past and we've gotten tremendous feedback. So I wanted to bring him back in 2023. Uh, on, on that note with 2023, you know, there's, there's, significant updates and and things being discussed uh, that TJ is going to review today that are really important to be at the forefront of your minds, whether you're the business owner or a C-level exec or, or handling the, the HR aspect of your business. Uh, so thank you for attending. Just a couple quick house cleaning items before we get into it. On the right hand side of your screen, there is a chat and a Q&A feature. Feel free to type in any questions as we go along. Uh, TJ is going to review um, how you can apply or at least uh, send over your uh, information for the SHRM and the HR credits that are going to be available to you today. Uh, there's also a handout uh, toggle on the right hand side. If you click on that, you're, um, there's a link that you can download that has all the webinars that URL has scheduled so far for 2023, not just my department. So a lot of great content. You know, Medicare is doing a ton of webinars. Uh, Elise from our health plan options uh, department is going to be a ton, doing a ton of webinars. So a lot of great stuff we're putting out for 2023. Please make sure you take a look at those. Uh, my next webinar is March Tuesday, March 14th at 10 a.m. Uh, I'll get a little bit into that at the end of the slide, but feel free to type in any Q&As. Feel free to download the handouts. Uh, I think that's it. Without further ado, TJ. All right. Uh, thanks, Thomas. I appreciate it. And welcome everyone here today. Um, I, as Thomas said, I'm a shareholder at Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney. I'm, I'm, I'm basically um, primarily out of our, our Harrisburg office. Um, just a, a little thing, uh, I guess a few tidbits about us. Um, I'm doing labor and employment stuff for about 18 years now. It's getting a little scary that 20 years is approaching pretty quickly. Um, but nonetheless, we have um, about 12 attorneys here now in Harrisburg, um, all based in Harrisburg, two paralegals and then, a, and then two practice assistants as well. Um, so we have a pretty big group here in Harrisburg, all again, you know, practicing labor and employment. Um, and then we have about 60 uh, attorneys that do labor and employment firm wide, about 400, 425 attorneys overall, but about 60 of us that are concentrating in labor and employment. So um, we are um, pretty well versed in labor and employment. We have, um, you know, we're up to date on everything that's going on in the labor and employment space. Um, and then I think that it's important to note that it includes, you know, immigration, you know, employment law, like wage and hour things, actual labor union things as well, including avoidance. Um, and then benefit, you know, ERISA type issues as well. So, um, like I said, anything in, involving the labor and employment world, um, we're, we're pretty well versed in it. Um, today, I just wanted to touch base with you on just some things that we're seeing in 2023, some updates. Um, I think it's important to note, though, from from the get go here um, that, you know, this isn't, you know, legal advice, um, something we say just about all our webinars or presentations. Um, it, it's meant to, to issue spot. It's, it's really hard, as most can imagine, to, you know, anticipate every single factual circumstance that you're going through individually. So it's always important for us to be able to outline, hey, here's what's going on um, in the employment space. 
Um, but there might be differences um, in how these issues are affecting your particular employee. So um, while this is good from a perspective of, hey, here's what happened in this instance, um, here's the court's outcome here, here's where we think this is going in this case, and you'll see we're, we're going to touch base on some Supreme Court cases right now um, that, are, that are pending at the Supreme Court. Um, and, and you'll see, though, that those factual circumstances are probably going to be a little bit different. So just remember what we're really hoping you take from here today um, is, is that we're issue spotting. We're seeing what's affecting our employees so that we're proactive to try to avoid any type of these issues coming up in our workforce. Um, so let me go ahead and make my screen here full. So here's what we're looking for, for from an agenda perspective. Oh, and as Thomas had mentioned, this, this course is eligible for SHRM and HRCI credits. At the end of this um, presentation, there's going to be a code um, as well as an email address that you can email. Um, it's an individual by the name of Pamela Mannion, who's great, my office, um, who um, will be able to get you the credits that you need. So at the end, you get the code, you email it to her, and then she'll let you know what, if anything else, she may need um, to make sure that you get the credits for this course. Uh, but again, it is eligible for Sherman, the HRCI credits. Um, so, so again, going back to what I was, I was talking about before, uh, we're really looking here to outline what in 2023 you should be looking for. First thing I want to go through is the EEOC update and predictions. Um, I think the most recent data that we have now is through 2021 with respect to the EEOC filings. Um, and that's not just charges. I know sometimes, um, you know, a lot concentrate on those charges that are ultimately filed. But interestingly enough, you're going to see here that those charges are actually down um, in filing. But what's really up is actually the EEOC's enforcement. So we're seeing them be a lot more active. And for, for those that don't know, when a charge is actually filed, whether the individual who filed that charge is represented by an attorney or not, the EEOC is well within its right to ultimately file an enforcement action against you as an employer based upon their findings during the investigation. So um, I think it's important to note that while these charges are down, we're really seeing the EEOC be a lot more active. And I'm actually in the process of handling a few of those matters now where the EEOC has actually filed actions against um, some of my clients. And um, those are, are, are completely different types of litigation. The EEOC brings those actions based upon administrative authority that has been given to them through the legislature that's a lot broader um, and quite frankly um, concerning um, for most employers when they ultimately have an action being investigated significantly by the EEOC or that what's known as an enforcement action when they actually go ahead and file um, litigation against you as a, as a client. So I do think it's important for you to um, be aware of that switch because I do think that kind of changes strategy a little bit as you're defending these charges that get filed by employees, even those that aren't represented. So we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the religious accommodation test. I think this is important. It, right now it's up at the Supreme Court of the United States. They're taking a look at a test that's been put in place since the 70s. Um, and they're looking to make some potential changes to that, which will be a little bit more burdensome on employers, um, a little bit more friendly to employees. So we'll talk through that. Also wanna talk about the PUMP Act, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. I have a lot of client questions that have come through that. Um, those recent amendments to those um, really are are expanding the law. Um, so there are some additional requirements that we have to deal with there. Um, exempt employers are now falling within the pump act. So as we'll talk about, that's gonna be something that you may need to address. Um, then I also wanna talk about the sexual harassment assault, the Arbitration and Non-Disclosure Act. It's, well, there was an act that was signed into law in 2022 that um, is essentially prohibiting um, employers from putting gag type clauses and non-disclosure agreements um, or provisions, I should say, in their agreements. So we're going to talk about that. There was also this week, there was an NLRB decision that was handed out um, that also affects the NLRA rights of employees, which um, even for those employers that are not unionized, right, that don't have unions, you still need to comply with that NLRA. Sometimes uh, folks don't really understand that. So that's that's an important thing as well. So we'll touch on that. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll get that. we'll talk about that a little bit more detail when we get there. 
Then salary transparency laws. This is a really big thing. We're seeing this all across the country. Um, New York is is really leading the charge, at least recently, with that first having several um, you know cities, municipalities putting into place certain salary transparency laws, um, and then New York State did as a whole as well. So that's a big, big issue. Um, paid sick leave statutes is another issue. Uh, Pennsylvania has, has something that's pending right now that I think is important. Um, but um, I also think with salary transparency and the paid sick leave uh, laws, it's come back to employers that might be based in jurisdictions that don't have those laws yet. However, with our remote workforce that we're seeing and we're seeing individuals who are working all across the country um, or they may be within those particular territories that have that salary transparency law or those paid sick leave statutes. So now whether or not that applies to you, given the fact that you may have one or more employees there um, is something that you know you ultimately have to consider. Um, Because quite frankly, getting up front and making sure that you've addressed those types of laws um, is is, and making sure whether or not they're applicable to your workforce or to your remote employees um, is important. Because if you don't do that up front on the back end, you can be facing some pretty, pretty harsh um, penalties and and back pay and and other types of litigation costs. So, um, you know, want to make sure that we outline that. Um, on the, the tail end of that, we'll also talk about a labor bulletin that's come out um, that addresses remote workers and some issues like FMLA type issues, um, break issues, things like that with a remote workforce are a little harder to to address. Um, but things that we have to make sure that we do as employers to, again, um, try to limit any potential liability. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the proposed rule to ban non-competes. Um, That's right now, I think comment period goes to March 10th. Um, That's something that's on the horizon. Um, As with several other agency actions that we've seen throughout the last year or so, you know, with the OSHA, um, you know, vaccine mandates and and other types of, um, even when it came to the uh, wage and hour um, mandate several years back, it was things that were challenged. So I'm sure there's going to be some litigation. Actually, I think the chamber um, has outlined that they're looking to uh, potentially take litigation options should the FTC actually put in place that rule. So there's a lot going on um, with respect to non-competes. Um, I think it's important because, you know, some of us um, are working at places that have legitimate, you know, business interest in in protecting certain confidential information um, and, you know, trying to protect those interests uh, with employees by, you know, paying them certain amounts so that they don't ultimately end up competing with you later or leaving to compete against you later after you've, um, you know, taught them the business and, you know, gave them access to your clients and things like that. So, again, all of these types of things I think are extremely important. Um, as you can see, there's a lot. Um, so again, the whole focus of today is mostly going to be on trying to kind of issue spot and make sure that that you guys are knowing what's affecting the workplace so that you can get ahead of it. So the EEOC update um, and the predictions. Um, so in 2021, they, they secured more than $485 million in monetary relief for over 15,000 victims of employment discrimination. So, you know, that's a significant amount of, of money and it's a lot of individuals for, you know, a single fiscal year. So I think that's that's something you have to be aware of. They really are a lot more active now. 138 merit lawsuits um, were, were resolved in, in just one year. That's again significant. Well, we're talking about you know nationwide, but nonetheless, there's still a lot of resources of the government that are being focused on these types of efforts. Um, they they've received favorable res- results in 95.7 percent of all district court resolutions, um, and and I think that's it really important to note because it goes to what I said earlier, which is the EEOC when they're bringing litigation against you, it's a different set of rules. They have a legislative authority. Um, to to bring enforcement actions on a very broad basis and uh, plaintiff's attorneys, you know, those that generally have brought these lawsuits against companies in the past, they didn't have that same authority. And quite frankly, um, there's really no other agency that I've seen that had has such broad authority. Um, so to me, this is kind of a different it's a different game. It's a different set of parameters that you have to deal with. And I think these numbers really, really show that. Um, so they, they secured a reduction of 9.1% of age inventory 
and that's in the appellate cases. I think that's that's important because one, I think they're looking to to move cases. There um, sometimes things can pen for quite some time. I think they they've really just put in focused efforts in. Okay, we got it. We, we've taken these actions. We got to get things moving. Um, so I think again, these are all important statistics because when you get that charge in, you really have to understand that you know that there, there could this could become something a lot bigger, um, a lot broader than what you would initially think when you have an employee that you've let go for legitimate reasons, and the EEOC ultimately gets under what I always like to say under the tent, you know, into your business, into your policies, into your procedures, um, and now things have gotten a little bit more. Um, broad or a little bit more out of control from where you thought you initially would end up when this was first filed. So again, I think these are all important statistics to know. There's a little bit of a chart that just kind of shows you, um, you know, the types of charges by claim type that we're seeing. You know, really, you can see how big you know retaliation is. Um, it really is 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 large. I mean, even as they've all kind of gone down charges wise in the last you know five years or so, you know, retaliation has been a big one. And I always tell employers, I always tell clients or individuals that reach out to me after a suit's been filed or after an employee has engaged in some sort of protected activity, um, is that the hardest one to defend a lot of times is that retaliation claim um, because, you know, they end up engaging in some type of protected activity close in time to when an adverse employment action happens. And now they have the ability to walk into an attorney's office or go to the EEOC and just explain the situation. And when there's that close timing aspect of it, um, they're generally getting advice to go forward with filing those charges. So you have to be very careful when you have individuals have engaged in some sort of protected activity. So be aware of that. So here's some for some predictions for the fiscal year 2023. Um, it's you know, look at the budget that we're, we're looking at here. Um, that's a $60 million increase over the prior year. I mean, that's a large number. Um, and, you know, they're they're looking to, again, take more and more actions against employers. Um, and they have that broad ability to do it. So just be careful about it. Um, they're going to hire more individuals. You're going to see that the, there's certain focused areas um, that you're, you're really going to see. And what they've come out to state right now, they're really looking at racial justice, systematic discrimination, uh, you know, of all protected bases. But they're also looking at pay equity um, and then the civil rights impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the one that that I'll add to this because I see it um, and the one enforcement action that I'm defending right now. Um, involves disability discrimination. I feel as though the EEOC has really been focused on that. I think that I've seen a lot of um, additional requests coming from the EEOC investigators when it involves disability type claims. So I really think you have to make sure if you take away anything with respect to this portion of the um, presentation is to make sure that you're putting in place good ADA policies. Um, really, that's one of the things that you should be, one of the issues that when your employees have those types of, of, of issues come up, that you really should take the conservative approach of really trying to engage in an interactive process, see whether or not you're able to accommodate you know, the employee with whatever type of accommodation that they're requesting. Make sure that you're interacting with them to a point where you get some medical information to the extent necessary through an ADA type questionnaire, right? And then also, um, you know, considering all potential accommodations that, that could be out there. One of the big ones and in, in, is the, this reassignment issue, right? So if you have somebody who um, cannot perform the essential functions of their position with or without a reasonable accommodation, but you have another position that they might be able to be reassigned to that's open, not asking you to create one, not saying you need to create light duty or anything, but maybe there's an open position that you're trying to fill. Um, is that something that you can do as an accommodation? Meaning, can you reassign them into that position? Um, the EEOC is looking for you to at least have that consideration. So, again, not saying you need to, um, not saying um, to make unnecessary medical inquiries into, into employees. What I'm saying is make sure that you engage in some interactive process with a, a defined procedures that, that make it so that you can look into these types of issues, see if you can accommodate. Because once you don't, you run the risk of potentially having a charge filed against you. And then now you have that potential of the EEOC investigation where they're quote unquote, under the tent, looking at all of your processes and procedures. So get ahead of it. Make sure you put those in place now, because that, I think, is going to be a really big 
um, issue for them in 2023 because I've seen it in the past and I think that's going to go well into the future. Um, other issue that I wanted to throw out here, too, is just keep an eye out. There's the Supreme Court's upcoming decision in the Harvard and North Carolina admission cases. So the North Carolina case, um, there's an admissions program that basically is saying that they favor Black, Hispanic, Native Americans over white and Asian applicants. You know, whether or not a program that's in place um, for that, um, you know, racial um, you know, uh, that diversity, you know, whether or not something like that that's put in place at, as an administration, as admissions process is in fact legal. So that's something that's going on in that North Carolina case. Harvard case is similar too, um, except there, there's some subjective standards that were being utilized um, that basically gauged, you know, certain traits like likability, courage, kindness, things like that, that um, it's alleged to affect certain um, racial classifications um, unfavorably. So that's that issue in that case as well. So, you know, we'll see, you know, what's going to end up happening there um, with the change in the court, um, you know, recently, I think they're, they're, they're thinking that we might see a change in, in a determination as to whether or not like a race conscious admissions policy is actually lawful or not. So, um, again, we should probably see something in, in 2023, probably, you know, by early summer or so um, with respect to those cases. So keep an eye out for those. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about religious accommodations. As I mentioned, there's this test from the 1977 Supreme Court decision in Trans World Airlines. You know, that that has been the test that we've used ever since then. And quite frankly, I, I was utilizing that test during COVID significantly. Um, you know, there were a lot of vaccine mandates that, you know, certain especially healthcare entities put in place, but all employers um, considered them at times. And you had to have a religious accommodation, um, you know, as well as a medical accommodation type process as part of those. Um, so there was a lot of different, uh, you know, assessments that were done. And essentially that undue burden was relatively easy to meet. Um, it's always been hard to meet when it comes to the ADA, but when it comes to, you know, religious accommodation requests, it's, it's easier to me. Um, however, that's now being um, reviewed. Um, and as I mentioned uh, before, it's on the slide here as well. The court appears to be willing to take a more employee friendly interpretation. Um, you know, we're going to see um, where, where it comes out. Um, but, you know, the, in January this year, the justice agreed that they're going to revisit this legal test. Um, and this is what that case is. Um, it actually started here in Pennsylvania in the Eastern District. And, you know, the Third Circuit ultimately um, had to address the issue. So this is something that is close to home for us here. Um, but essentially, you know, it's the USPS and Amazon coming to uh, an agreement where they were going to be deliveries made on, on, on Sunday by USPS on behalf of Amazon. Um, an individual requested not to work on Sundays for religious accommodation, uh, as a religious accommodation, I should say. Um, and there was some, you know, back and forth here. I think um, there was an interactive process that ultimately was engaged in. Um, whether or not the outcome of that interactive process is ultimately going to be upheld as being correct is going to be um, a decision, I think, for the Supreme Court. But both the Eastern District and the Third Circuit thought that, um, you know, the summary judgment in favor of USPAS was was appropriate. And again, we're going to see what ultimately um, the Supreme Court thinks of it. But I think no matter what, what we're going to see is a difference in the test that we need to apply when an employee does request a religious accommodation. Um, and I will tell you that I've seen a lot of these types of issues come up um, a lot. And I think it's coming up in the COVID context, as I mentioned, but it's also coming up where we have a lot of uh, a more diverse workforce. Um, and when folks are coming in from different countries, they may have different holidays that they celebrate on different days, things that might not be um, known to uh, to everyone. Um, and therefore, when they're bringing these things to you, um, I've had people come to me after the fact, after denying those types of requests, um, when in fact it turns out that those are in fact valid religious holidays in the countries that they're from. And they're things that we need to go through process wise to ensure that we're potentially able to or not able to accommodate them due, whether, due to whether it's an undue burden or not. So as we're making those determinations now, 
Um, and as you're doing those, those determinations, you need to make sure that you're looking at it from the perspective of this standard potentially being, being changed. Um, so I, I would make sure that uh, any request you get for a religious accommodation, that you're engaging in that interactive process, you're looking at any ability for you to potentially be able to accommodate that. Um, is there the ability to give unpaid leave? Um, is there ability to change your holiday policy to um, allow for individuals to have access to certain amounts of holidays in a year and then they get to choose those holidays? Um, and does that help maybe your staffing on the holidays that you traditionally have? Again, there's so many different factors that you needed to discuss and see what potentially works for you as an employer. Um, again, it's important to realize that you don't necessarily need to accommodate it, but you have to go through the process. Again, it's an interactive process. That's the key part that if you don't do, you can find yourself with some liability. Now, again, if you make the wrong determination, there's also potential for liability, but at the very least, you're setting yourself up to understand, okay, this is the position we're gonna take. Here's what it's based upon. Here's what we have to support that. And if it's challenged, we feel very comfortable we're in the best position possible to, to ultimately defend that challenge. So. Again, just, just make sure you guys are, are aware of this potential change. All right, so providing urgent maternal protection for Nursing Mothers Act. Um, I think this one is um, a relatively easier issue and that it's pretty clear as to what's required. But you know, you have the previous law which covered non-exempt employee, reasonable break time to express uh, breast milk up to one year after the child's birth. Each time such employee had a need to express milk, right, requires a place other than a bathroom that's shielded from view and, and, and free from intrusion, right? So that's what the previous law had required. So we all are pretty familiar, I'm sure, with those requirements. Here now there's three main changes. So now you're expanding the workplace protections for lactating workers, you're clarifying employers' obligations, and then you're ensuring that the breastfeeding mothers have access to appropriate remedies, right? So now that you're looking to include, so what's the expansion? Now we're including exempt employees. So previously it was just non-exempt, now it also includes exempt employees. Um, expands to employees who are expressing milk due to other circumstances, such as a stillborn child or a surrogacy issue. So now there's no um, real um, issues with that. Now we would generally advise in those situations to provide um, just because, you know, it was something that that made sense and was under really the purposes of, of the act pre previously. But now it's clear. Um, and then now it's up from one year to two years um, for the time of accommodation. Um, and, and you look here at the time spent expressing milk, you know, if the employee is still working, any break time spent pumping should be considered hours worked if it's a non-exempt employee situation. If you're not completely relieved from duty during the break, then they're considered to be working, right? So um, if they're answering emails or if there's something that's, you know, occurring work-wise, um, you know, that's, again, it's, it's, it's hours worked, um, quite frankly, you know, to, to whenever it comes to wage and hours issues, you know, it's it's much less of a potential liability to take error on the side of caution and consider things hours worked. Um, and that way you don't have to worry about the potential penalties if something's later considered an hours work. And those penalties, you know, are pretty significant. Um, and they also include potential attorney's fees, um, you know, as well as interest and things like that. So again, you know, just make sure you, you understand you know, what these issues are, how they affect your workplace, and that you're putting things in policies and procedures so that it's clear. Um, and if there's ever any type of dispute over anything that, you know, you have something in writing that details that you were complying with the law. Here's some of the uh, remedies. Now, there is cure period um, that is built into this. So um, I think you know, this kind of does provide employers with the ability to ensure that they're they're doing what they need to do. Um, but there, if they don't, you know, there is the potential to, you know, recover back pay and reinstatement. So again, just be, be very aware of that. 
Um, I, did, I have gotten some questions before we move here on to the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act as to, you know, the exempt employees, um, some exempt employees, you know, for instance, in healthcare type entities, they have, you know, a certain amount of patients they're supposed to see in a particular day, um, or maybe there's like sales or other types of quotas or things like that. I think it's very key that this really does depend on the circumstances. But generally speaking, you know, you, you don't have to change the job to comply with the PUMP Act. Um, however, you may need to accommodate, you know, individuals, maybe having a, uh, giving them additional time outside of the, the general working hours for your for your place of employment, um, or maybe um, there's some other type of accommodation that you can help to ensure that they're getting the protection under the Pump Act, but then also still able to complete the actual requirements of of their position. So again, it's, it's another issue spotting type, um, you know, thing I wanted to make sure that I pointed out there. Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. So it's going to provide enhanced protections for pregnant for pregnant women. You know, currently the PDA it, it bans discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or other related conditions, but it lacks any requirement that employers provide reasonable accommodations for pregnant workers. Um, and again, that's arguable as to whether or not that's true. But um, you know, I think from a, a, a specific plain language reading of the PDA. Um, that is a true statement, but again, I think from um, a practical advice standpoint, at least coming from, from my office, is going to be more to take the conservative approach of trying to accommodate individuals that were in that type of situation. However, here it's now more, it's expressed. So now you're looking at, you know, require, it ensures that pregnant workers who work for employers with 15 or more employees, that they receive reasonable accommodations. So additional bathroom breaks, light duty, a uh, stool to sit on um, if a worker stands all day. Now, they still have the undue hardship aspect of it. So again, it goes back to the same thing I've been saying a lot, which is this interactive process. You have to engage and document that interactive process, if, especially if you're gonna take the position that it is in, in fact an undue hardship. The other thing I'll, I'll point out here is that a lot of times employers to um, address workers compensation issues, you know, they'll set or put in place some sort of a light duty type program um, to get those workers into the workplace. Um, again, from a workers comp perspective, because they ultimately have to be paying them anyway. Um, you have to remember if you're going to put a program like that in place, well, then you may also need to have to do that with respect to those that are pregnant that might require light duty. So again, light duty is something that you may have to address now, given one, the PDA and, and the changes here that have been made, but two, if you're also providing light duty to those that are on workers comp. We see a lot of um, you know clients and companies getting in, in a little trouble for not making sure that um, that they're addressing things equally. That you're not treating those who are on workers' comp more favorably than those who who are pregnant. So as I mentioned earlier, to um, President Biden, <coughs> excuse me, um, signed. Um, <clears throat> the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act of, of 2021. Um, it passed with bipartisan support, um, and it amends the FAA um, and renders unenforceable at the claimant's option, so your employee's option, pre-dispute arbitration agreements and joint action waivers regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment disputes. So effective December 7th, uh, at the end of last year, courts you know, cannot enforce a non-disclosure clause or a non-disparagement clause agreed to before a dispute arises in involving sexual harassment. So it, is, it essentially renders unenforceable non-disclosure and non-disparagement clauses related to allegations of sexual assault or sexual harassment. Um, and that even if they were entered into before, like the dispute arose. So you just need to make sure that you're, you're aware that those types of agreements that, you know, we may have signed, you know, severance agreements are the big ones, right? Where you have certain quote unquote gag orders. Um, and now they're basically stating that that's, those aren't enforceable. Um, and that's something that I think is extremely important for us to realize. Now there are other ways that you can address these types of issues um, that, um, you know, certain language can be included in, in, certain severance agreements or settlement agreements that are reached to ultimately um, try to um, ensure that there is some confidentiality 
um, related to those types of issues. Um, for instance, if you know you understand the releases that are generally in severance agreements, um, they'll they'll contain certain language with respect to you know wage and hour releases and things like that, which aren't technically enforceable unless approved by a court um, or by an agency. And generally, when you are having an employee leave um, and they're getting some sort of a severance, you don't look for court approval or get, you know, an agency to approve it. Right. But you do include certain language in there about them asserting or confirming that there are no, um, outstanding wages that they're entitled to or owed, um, other than what's outlined in that agreement and things like that ultimately help should there end up being a challenge later to, um, them being receiving the wage and hour, um, the wage an hour, um, or I should say the wages that they're entitled to. Um, and if they bring that suit later on, you'll not only be able to point to that release, which again may not be held enforceable, but you will be able to point to the affirmative statements and admissions that they've made. Now, is that going to be an ironclad you know, defense to a case like that? Maybe, maybe not, depends on the circumstances, but I think it's similar here when you're addressing sexual harassment um, or sexual assault type issues um, as well. Can you put some language in there that, you know, maybe get them to assert that these aren't issues that, that exist or they don't know any facts or circumstances like that that exist at the time. Again, just certain things that you should think about, um, maybe talk to with an attorney, you know, should you um, think about wanting to, you know, ultimately um, revise or address this issue when it comes to your severance agreements, which again, I think I think you need to do. Um, I, I mentioned early on that there was a recent NLRB decision that's similar to this. Um, it's a call. It's the McLaren decision, um, but essentially they're saying that these confidentiality and non disparagement disparagement provisions, you know, they may violate the NLRA, which again applies to all employers, whether they have a unionized workforce or not. So I think you need to make sure that you're also looking at your severance agreements or settlement agreements um, and you're, you're, you're taking a look at it from these recent decisions and these recent um, legislation that's, that's been enacted to make sure that you're addressing them. Because if not, you can find one yourself ultimately in a, a position where you violated um, you know, one of these, these newer laws that have come out or two, you know, not getting the protection that you thought you were getting. So again, issue spot. Um, make sure that you're looking to get these addressed. Salary transparency laws. Um, this is a major issue in 2023. Um, I, I think um, this is this is really something that that you guys need to make sure that you're addressing. Um, we do have a lot of places having remote employees now. Where are they located? Are they located in an, a an area that has a salary transparency law that's in a place? Um, if if they are, does it apply to them? Um, what requirements do you need to have? Um, and then now that these salaries are going to be more widely known and advertised, what is that going to have with respect to pay equity um, issues um, with respect to your workforce? Meaning, you know, sometimes you may have to pay a little bit more to get somebody else to come into a position where you already have two or three other employees there. Well, now, um, depending on who you hire, who comes into that position, certain other factors, including experience and things like that, do you now have to do a pay equity analysis and potentially address the salaries of those that you have currently working for you? Um, so th this issue is, is, is a major issue. Um, those pay equity analysis, I, I have said for a long time, need to be done. However, now with the information out there, you know, there's really no closed compensation anymore. So if there's no closed compensation, now people are going to know who's making what. And at that point, now these issues are going to come to the forefront. So you have to really take a look at these salary transparency laws, see if they're applicable to you, if they're applicable to anybody in your workforce. And if so, you know, what do you need to do to address them? One, and then two, you know, have we done a pay equity analysis to our workforce? And, um, where are we? Are we comfortable with that? Are we comfortable that if we have, 
you know, a female employee that's been working for us for, for quite some time. And then we bring in a male employee and it, we had to pay more to get that person to come over. Are we comfortable keeping the female employee salary where they're at when they're going to be performing the same same functions? And if we are, well, then we better have a valid reason for it, considering maybe, you know, experience or some other legitimate business factor that we have to look at. You know, maybe there's additional schooling or certifications or, or again, experience just basic on, on based on years of experience. So you want to look at all of those types of issues, you know, as you're addressing salary transparency laws, because, again, this is something should have been done for a long time. But it's definitely going to be brought to the forefront now that people are going to know what individuals are making in certain types of positions. So here on, you know, you'll see, um, as I said, New York State recently signed into law salary transparency um, law. And, you know, this is you have to put a minimum, maximum annual salary, hourly wage. You know, it includes internal promotions or transfers. Um, and you also must disclose the job description up front as well. So just this is really just, um, you know, just examples, but you're looking at California, Colorado, Connecticut, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Nevada, Rhode Island. And then you can see like look, Cincinnati, Ohio, Westchester County, New York, Ithaca, New York, Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, so they all are starting to get their own, you know, right, like, you know, city or municipality type. Um, laws that are being enacted. And sometimes you may have to comply with the New York City law as well as the overall New York law, right? You may have to comply with Jersey City, New Jersey's law as well as New Jersey. So you really have to look at what the requirements are. I will tell you that most of them seem to be the same or similar. Um, that said, you really want to look at each of them. Um, and if you have remote employees, you need to find out where are they? Where are they operating out of? Um, and you'll see as we go a little bit further and we start talking about the, the, the remote employees labor bulletin that came out. But I think, you know, it's important that if you're allowing remote employees, you need to have paperwork in place as to as to establish one where they are physically located. Um, and then two, well, what location of ours are they assigned to? Right. You need to make sure that we're addressing those types of issues because there's a lot of different laws that you're going to need to make sure that you are, are looking at to see whether or not you need to comply with them. Do they apply to you? One. And then two, do your standard policies, you know, actually address them appropriately or do you need to expand upon them? Um, if you do need to expand upon them, is that something you want to do across your whole workforce or are you going to limit it to those individuals that are within the territories that have those additional protections? So, again, issue spotting, trying to figure out, you know, that and getting ahead of these types of issues before before they come to the forefront. So key takeaways there, though, evaluate, comply with the obligations under the current crop of pay transparency laws and then consider engaging counsel to conduct that pay equity analysis because you may have to make some modifications there. Um, you only need one person. So to be clear, you only need one person for a plaintiff to point to. So if you have one female employee who can point to one male employee that's making more for the same job, that's all you need to potentially sustain a claim. All right. And at that point, now the burden is going to be on you to establish, well, why is that that male employee being paid more? So uh, the, the U.S., uh, women's national soccer team was, you know, in, in the news, right? And that was, you know, exactly what happened there. They were paid less, right, for the same work. And then U.S. soccer came out and said, well, it's because of the revenue, even though the women's team is better and has better results than the men's national team is, they get paid more um, from the World Cup finishes, from other types of tournaments, from sponsorships, from ticket sales, and that's why they were ultimately getting paid less than with the men's team. Whether you agree from that or not, that was the argument that they, they brought forth. And ultimately, and thankfully, they were able to come to some sort of a resolution um, that ultimately addressed things, especially on a going forward basis, but also going backwards. Um, and, you know, again, I think that highlights just the need to make sure that you're doing this pay equity equity audit. You're understanding what the what the data is, you're detecting and resolving any disparities. And you want to do this before it becomes an issue, because once it becomes an issue, you have the publicity and then you have the penalties. Um, so, again, something that I think you just need to make sure you get ahead of.
So I think this is this is also important for things that you want to do if you find yourself in a location um, where there is a salary transparency law, or if you want to just start getting ahead of it now and you just want to start just putting out there um, what you know these laws generally require from a minimum and maximum salary. But here, here are there some things that you might want to start looking to do: develop those job descriptions, you know, for the external applicant positions and for the internal promotion or transfer opportunities. You know, if there are going to be differences, right? Well, let's make it so that it, you, we can see that, right? So maybe that there's going to be a position one and a position two. You know, I know that there's some like I think the, the state does that for attorneys. They have like an attorney position one, then they have an attorney position two, an attorney position three, and then each of those have their own salary ranges. So if you are going to potentially be looking to add additional positions, right, does it make sense for you to potentially say, OK, those that are in this job for periods one through four, you know, they're going to be getting whatever the position name is one. And then for those five through eight, they're going to be whatever the position name is two. Um, and then you obviously need to make sure that you're appropriately putting individuals in each of those boxes, but at least there is something there now that that details, okay, here's why, you know, somebody who might be in position one is getting paid less than somebody who might be in position two. Um, but that's got to be supported by certain job descriptions and then the reality as to what those individuals are doing on a day-to-day on -day basis. Paid sick leave statutes in 2023. Um, I won't spend too, too much time going through every single element of these, because again, I think the important part here is making sure that you've looked at where your employees are located, um, where, um, and that includes the remote employees, and then whether or not there's these paid sick leave laws that are applicable to you, given that you have employees in jurisdictions where they have these types of laws. Um, and I think it's also important, we'll get to in a second, to realize that Pennsylvania is also, um, you know, considering enacting one as well. Um, now, you know, historically, you know, having to, you know, provide holiday pay or PTO might not necessarily be required under the law. Um, people and companies have done that because it helps to attract talent um, and it's just become the norm. Um, here, however, now you're looking at actually having protections for those that need paid sick leave, right? So you need to look at your policies. Maybe they already comply with these. But again, issue spot, find out where your employees are, find out if there's any additional requirements there. And if so, are our, our, our current policies in compliance with those? So here's the Pennsylvania proposed sick leave law. Allegheny County is another one that we, we included in here because it's an enacted law. Um, you can see some differences that are here. Um, I think, um, you know, it's one hour for every 30 hours work compared to one hour for every 35 hours worked. Um, there's some differences here from employees or family members, as opposed to here just being existing health condition, preventative care. Um, so there are differences between them. But if you have employees who are in Allegheny County, look at the fact that this is enacted. And then Pennsylvania, it's something that's being proposed at this time. Some additional changes. Again, I'm not going to go through each and every, or differences, I should say. I'm not going to go through each and every one. I mean, they're on the slides here. Um, but I think it's important, again, just to show you that there's going to be disparities. So, you know, you really want to look at where your employees are and then where or how many different types of laws might be applicable to them. You know, once if Pennsylvania does get enacted, well, for those in Allegheny County, you've got to comply with both of those laws. So that's the same in, in, in other jurisdictions as well. TJ, uh, how close is Pennsylvania to uh, enacting a law like that? I realize a lot of our surrounding states like Maryland are, are going have gone down that road. Are, are you are we close to the finish line in that regard or we've is this very preliminary stages with PA um, implementing? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to touch base with our government relations folks to see where we're at with it. I will tell you, though, that I can I, I can see a trend across the country of these being enacted. Um, so yeah. I, I would be surprised if, you know, we're we're looking at at this time next year and we're not seeing something close to being implemented if it hasn't already been implemented. Um, but it, you never know. These things can sign, can sometimes get held up. 
But that said, it, there's a lot of bipartisan support, right? So I do think that this is something that will be enacted at some point in, in the coming years. Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't know priority wise where it was with the legislation. Thank you for that. Hey, we um, just to give you a time update, we got about 10 minutes too. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So again, just there are just some requirements, San Francisco, Michigan. Um, just, you know, some things that I thought were worth noting here. Um, you know, you can, you know, use sick leave for any reason. Not all state localities allow leave to be utilized for time off due to reasons related to domestic or sexual violence and stalking, you know, but some are, and I'm really seeing a lot of these states are really looking to address those issues in this type of a law as well. So again, just be, be aware of it. Um, honestly, if you haven't put these, these policies in place um, and these issues do come up, that should be something again, that should kind of say, okay, this is an issue I should look into. Maybe it's something I have to, I have to actually am required to provide to them, given it's a remote employee and where they're working at. Right. So again, just make sure you're, 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 you're kind of keeping an ear out for these types of issues. So here we're looking at some wage and hour division issues, field assistant bulletin that came out. Um, the, the issues that were addressed in this were short breaks, um, longer breaks and off-duty time. Excuse me, the break time for pumping breast milk and privacy to pump and then telework and FMLA. Um, and again, it's a bulletin um, done by the Wage and Hour Division. Um, I think it's important that, you know, you always look to comply with these bulletins because obviously the, they've felt this to be an enforcement issue if they're actually putting it out there. So it's something I thought was good to kind of go through again, just from an issue spotting perspective. You know, they have, you know, again, short breaks, if it's 20 minutes or less, you know, regardless whether they're working in the office or teleworking off site, you know, it's something that you're going to have to, to, to pay for. Longer breaks, off duty time. You know, if it's, again, if they're longer than 20 minutes, you know, and they're not, and they can do whatever they want during the break and they're completely relieved from duty, you know, it's not going to be considered time work that needs to be paid. Um, so I think it's it's really important, though, to make sure that you have policies and procedures in place to ensure that these are being addressed, right? You want to make sure that you have, you know, time reporting policies or time reporting sheets or, you know, a lot of my clients have switched to apps, right, that they have where employees can, you know, go in and they can, you know, state when they're working, when they're not working. Um, and those types of things are all important because when, you know, you're having a remote employee, it's hard necessarily to supervise these things. So you want to make sure that you're putting the onus on them to report the hours that are worked. Then if you get to the point where you have employees that are also reporting additional hours um, beyond what you believe the position needs, maybe it includes overtime hours, things like that. Well, you know, you ultimately are going to have to pay those hours um, if they're reporting them to you, unless you have some really valid, strong, concrete proof that they weren't in fact working. So the best way to address those issues are generally going to require individuals to have to seek approval before agree, before permitting themselves to perform any type of overtime. Now, if they still do it in violation of that policy, right, you still have to pay for the time worked, but you can address it through a disciplinary process, right, because they're not complying with policies. So again, remote employees, this is a bigger issue now because they're not there, right, um, and you're not sure when they're working. Some people have a little bit different hours that they're working now. So again, it's all stuff that you need to issue spot and make sure that you're addressing. Um, this is another question I get a lot with the remote employees and those that are close to 50 employees. Well, where's their work site? You know, they're remote, they're working, you know, all the way out in Florida. Uh, that seems to be a big one where we have people who are down in Florida with remote employees working down there. Well, where's their work site? Is it their home? For FMLA eligibility purposes, it's not. Um, it's the place where they get their work assignments or direction from. So again, you know, some think that, well, with the remote employees, there's further than 75 miles. I don't have to worry about that from LA when I get close. Um, and that's just not the case. So make sure that you're, you're, you're looking at um, where everyone's working, where they're getting their work assignments or directions when you're doing that analysis. Practical takeaways, um, you know, the obligations are FLSA absolutely remain intact. You know, you have to exercise reasonable diligence to track the teleworkers work hours. As I mentioned, um, you have to create, you know, lactation space for breastfeeding employees, even when working away from the office. 
Um, so I think that's important as well. And then you're going to have to review your FMLA policies to make sure you're complying with the latest guidance on determining eligibility for remote workers. Again, these are all things that will change and have changed recently. So you have to make sure that you're aware of them. You've looked at your policies and making sure you're complying with all of these changes. Um, so quickly, I also wanted to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, this FTC proposed rule banning non-competes. Um, honestly, a non-compete, I think, can be very beneficial, um, especially if you have a type of business that, um, you know, makes sense um, to have somebody with a non-compete clause, right? Somebody that you're given access to all your, your confidential, you know, trade secret type information. You're given access to your clients, things like that. You know, you want to be able to protect yourself um, and, you know, you feel as though, you know, you've, you're paying. Um, for them to want to have and, and, and get access to that and ultimately um, to perform their duty, you don't want them to ultimately leave and go somewhere or start a competing business that ultimately goes against you and potentially harms, you know, your business. Um, so um, that is something that I think employers historically have always liked. Um, but there's also now um, a thought that that may violate, you know, comp anti-competition. Um, that might be anti-competition, I should say. And now there's looking at proposing a rule that's going to ban those. Um, so it's not in place yet. Um, and I believe on the next slide, yeah, it talks about March 10th, 2023 is the deadline for public comment. Um, after final rule publication, the rule will be effective 30 days. I would imagine that at some point that's going to happen this year, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this out. Um, that would ultimately require employers to rescind existing non-compete agreements. Um, I can pretty much guarantee you that once this gets put in place, you're going to have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce challenging it. Um, they're going to be looking for a stay of implementing it um, until it is. Um, I, I would think a stay would be ultimately issued, but again, well, only time will tell. So we have to be you know, just aware that this is there. Um, and that it's something that we may ultimately need to address. Um, I also um, wanted to, to, to point that you can look at other ways to potentially uh, protect those business interests. For instance, can you put a non-solicitation of clients provision in there? Can you um, put in some sort of a um, program in place that um, provides some sort of benefits um, later to, um, the, to the, your employees. So there's certain type of like incentive type programs that you can design that basically says, hey, if you don't work you know, for a competitor, um, then you're gonna get some sort of payments after the fact um, where they've earned those payments or they've basically had earned a potential entitlement to those payments. Um, so we've seen kind of programs put out there that, that are like that, that I think um, have a, more of a chance of being enforced, less of a chance to have having, you know, this rule effect. So if there's something that you really want to ensure that you have that protection, you should probably start talking and um, with an attorney and trying to game plan, you know, what programs you can put in place to potentially protect those interests. Um, again, it's going to be industry specific. It's going to be really employer specific, but there are options. So if that is a legitimate interest of yours, um, it's definitely worth uh, a follow up conversation. Um, so with that, I know we only have a couple minutes left. I want to make sure that I give everybody the code here. <coughs> um, you want to uh, email Pam Mannion. Um, you basically email her, ask her or tell her which credits you need. Um, give her any of the identifying information. Um, that you, you know, she will require for you to ultimately be able to, to get credit for SHRM or HRCI. And then if there's any questions or anything like that, you can always feel free to reach out to her um, or email her. If um, you want, you can also email me, reach out to me. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, my contact information is in the, in the, in the slides here. Um, and I think you should have access to the slides, but if not, or if you need any um, another copy of those slides, feel free again, just send me an email or give me a call and we'll get you a copy of them. Thank you, TJ. For everyone on the call, I'm putting that uh, in the chat as well. Uh, I did real quick, TJ, I did have one question. Thank you so much, man. Talk about some 
uh, noteworthy content that we're reviewing for 2023 and, and what employers need to be watching out for, you know, pay transparency, the, the sick leave, uh, it's non-competes. It's really going to be interesting. And there's a lot of challenges there. It's going to be interesting how that all plays out. Um, the question I had in turn for the, uh, this is in regards to the non-competes. Um, so it's my understanding that it's, you know, it's, uh, and that those those can change state by on a state by state basis and in Pennsylvania um what's the length of the term of a, a non-compete contract currently before it's considered void how I guess they're asking how often should employers be updating their their non-competes and having employees sign those yeah so you have to remember that your your non-compete is only going to be enforceable if there's consideration. So consideration can be done up at the, 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 the beginning of the relationship. So you make the offer of employment contingent on them signing a non-compete. Um, at that time, you should have already assessed, given the position that they're going to have your legitimate interests in what you're looking to protect, right? And then what is reasonable, right? So generally what you're going to see, depending on the circumstances, are going to be different time periods. Now, what you can do is you can do what's known as blue penciling. So you can say, hey, I'm going to put a two year um, restriction in here and it's going to be a radius of, say, 50 miles. Um, and, and then you put a blue pencil provision in there and says, hey, if it turns out that this isn't reasonable in the eyes of a court, well, then the court has the obligation at that point to put into it and read into it what is reasonable. So maybe the court will look at this and say, hey, given everything, it really is about a year would make sense to protect your legitimate interest and 25 miles. And then they ultimately would look at it from that perspective and apply it in that fashion. But you want your agreement to include the language to permit the court to do that. One, then two, once you're looking to change a non-compete while that employee is already working for you, you run the risk of potentially now having that lack of consideration argument um, being made. So generally, we're looking at really not doing it unless you're going to lessen it. Then you have a better argument there. But then, two, what you could do is you can make it as part of a bonus payment that they wouldn't not un, uh, they wouldn't normally be. Um, entitled to, right? So then now you have that additional consideration that you can give to them for that issue. So it really depends on the circumstances, but those are ways that you can kind of look at this from a general perspective to address what your particular needs might be. Right. Thank you. That's that's uh, super helpful. It's interesting regarding the radius and, and, and length of time. I've seen non-competes anywhere from a year and and you know a couple miles like you referred to up and you up to five years and and you know a couple miles so it's it's uh something to be uh concerned about if you're an employer for sure and luckily we have we have you for that tj so those mm -hmm. those are all the questions thank you everyone for attending hopefully you got some value out of this a lot of things on the horizon for 2023 please check out uh, the webinars underneath the handouts and sign up for any you feel might add value uh, we're here for you if you need us don't hesitate to reach out to myself or tj with any follow-up questions and uh, i hope you're off to a great 2023 and hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar thanks everyone yep thanks everyone